The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to the show. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. I know on Thanksgiving Day, Lewis, I went to, uh, I actually went to the movies at night and I saw the new James Bond movie. Thought it was good. Thought the last 20 minutes were just kind of generic action movie type of thing. You saw it too, right? I did. I enjoyed yeah. it. But very good acting, you know, I thought, and it was just well put together. One of the better James Bond movies, oh, I definitely. would say. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know what's insane, though? For the last, it's probably been 18 months, maybe even a couple years, since I've been to the local commercial Cineplex-style movie theater. I've been going to other movie theaters in the area lately, and I was taken aback at the amount of advertising, previews, and all sorts of nonsense that was going on. The movie was supposed to start at 7.15, okay? So figuring it would be kind of busy, we got there around 7, sat down. Now, there's already... Wi- Add just commercials playing with loud audio, okay? So you can't even chat with the people you're with because even though it's 15 minutes before the previews start, there's already really loud commercials playing for TV shows, products, all sorts of stuff. Okay, finally, at like 7.17, the lights go down slightly, and now you have your pre-preview previews and commercials that are, of course, after... The, the loud TV commercials before, you know, the lights start going down. So then there's ads for, like, the movie theater chain itself, for various products that are endorsed or co-marketed with the movie chain, so on and so forth. Right. Three different skits about turning your cell phone off, of course, branded heavily with the movie theater. So finally, remember, 7.15, the movie starts. Okay. By 7.25, we're finally ready for the previews to begin. <laughs> And then at this point, there's 20 minutes of previews. Literally, 7.45 is when the actual movie started, set for 7.15. And if you got there just 10 or 15 minutes early, you've, at this point, you've sat through 45 minutes of advertising. It's incredible that this is what is considered normal at this point. Yep. I, I mean, I remember even, well, okay, maybe it was like 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, there were no advertisements before a movie. There were just the previews. Right, exactly. And then you started seeing the big Coca-Cola ads. And then the silent, just at least it would be just like a still image. A still ad. image, yeah. right, right. Um, and a lot of it just had to do with the food they sell in the movie theater. Right. And it's it's completely spiraled out of control. Needless to say, I hope it's another 18 months before I have to go back to that movie theater and I can support the local movie theaters instead. Yeah, I mean, anytime I, I get the opportunity, I go to the smaller local ones. For yeah. sure. A, uh, a strip club exploded down the road from our studio. This is Scores Gentlemen's Club in Springfield, Massachusetts. Apparently, the smell of gas was reported around four, four-ish in the afternoon on, uh, on Friday. And then they sent out gas employees to actually check what was going on. And I guess a normal thing that's done is you basically drill a little hole into the ground to check if there's a reading of, of gas, of natural gas there in the pocket of soil, so to speak. And I guess it accidentally, the probe accidentally punctured a pipe. And an hour later, that led to the explosion. I mean, the place was completely leveled, including, I I mean, buildings all around were were damaged, but the the actual strip club was completely destroyed. And the gas company has actually uh, basically taken responsibility for what happened. They're going to be compensating everybody involved. Wow. Yeah. Um, At first, I thought it might have been some type of insurance fraud, but... I guess not. Sounds not. Yeah, a friend of mine lives very close, and her windows were actually completely blown out. She wasn't there. She was on the uh, near Cape Cod or Boston area or something for Thanksgiving, and she just heard from people in her building that her windows were completely destroyed. Yeah, I started getting text messages that there was some huge explosion in Springfield. The weird thing though is that nobody was killed, and which is great. But literally, I, I don't. I guess the entire place must have been evacuated. There was an hour from when the gas was smelled until the explosion, so maybe everybody was gone. But these strip clubs are open, as far as I know, close to 24 hours a day, aren't they? Uh, I really don't know. Yeah. But uh, there were a lot of injuries. Um, but I believe that was mostly just responders. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the two main injuries was like a photographer for a local news station. But, huh. you know, strip clubs are dangerous places. They, they're liable to expl- uh, basically spontaneously combust at any time. Not just that. At, at the strip clubs around us, there are often shootings as well. That's true. Plenty of shootings and stabbings. Yeah, that's true. It, it better to avoid, I think. Right? I, I think so. Very good. That's a word from Lewis, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it. Listen up, kids. Avoid strip clubs. Says me. There you go. Yeah. Even though on the bonus show, you have told the story about when you were choked at a strip club by a stripper. Right. But that's, right. I don't want to, that's a bonus show story, which you told. I don't want to go into that here. Yeah. I, sign I mean, up. That that's a, a I don't go to them anymore. If that, that's not a reason to sign up for the bonus show, I don't know what is. Good point. Also on Black Friday, Walmart 
hit by protests and strikes across 46 states. This is a little bit, there's two sides to the story. On the one hand, we're hearing from the pro-strike, pro-protest advocates that there were uh, protesters all over the country, a thousand protests in 46 states, Walmart workers in uh, Atlanta, Miami, Dallas, Wisconsin, California's Bay Area, Chicago, etc., walking out, protesting wages, protesting work conditions, protesting having to work on, on Thanksgiving, so many other things. On the other hand, Walmart is countering that it had the best Black Friday ever. Now, it's a little bit weird for me to hear that because at the time I read that article, Black Friday, was the stores were still open on Black Friday. So is it just propaganda or was it such a good Black Friday that even only halfway through it, they already knew that it was the best Black Friday ever? I don't really know. It sounds like it might be typical uh, corporate PR. It could be. I know online sales hit an all-time high. Uh, for Walmart specifically? No, overall. Overall. I mean, uh, for Black Friday. So, could be that they did have uh, the biggest Black Friday ever. I mean, as your pop our population gets bigger, it's really no surprise. In the aggregate, there will be records, of yeah. course. The other comment from Walmart was that the majority of protesters were not actually Walmart workers. They said, only 26 protests occurred, and many of them did not include any Walmart associates. This is according to Bill Simon, Walmart's U.S. president and CEO. He said, we had a very safe and successful Black Friday event uh, at our stores across the country, and we heard positive feedback, so on and so forth. A friend of ours actually had to work, Thanksgiving, who works at Walmart, Thanksgiving night at midnight. He had to go in. And it's funny, when I left the movie theater around 9.45, 10 on, on a Thursday night, I said, let's just drive by the Walmart that's nearby just to see what's going on. And there, was a, there were hundreds of people, I mean, literally lined up. It, it was just it's shocking what's going on in this country with, with, with this entire thing. I mean, I'm, I'm taken aback by it. Yeah. Uh, there were even protests at our local Walmart, the one right near me. Uh, my girlfriend went there on Black Friday, and she's like, she's all of a sudden calls me and says, oh, my God, it's crazy here. Yeah. Like, there are protests everywhere. There are people running around the store yelling things, chanting things. Like, <laughs> she just got, got the hell out of there, like, real fast. Well, today is Cyber Monday, and I want to make sure people know that the David Pakman Show has a Cyber Monday special. Just go to davidpakman.com slash Cyber Monday. It's a fantastic thing. Today only, hours left, sign up, et cetera, et cetera. A couple of other things to get to Thanksgiving-related. Conservative groups are angry that for the fourth straight year, President Obama did not mention God in his Thanksgiving resolution. So DrudgeReport.com linked to an article on LifeNews.com, and it said the following. It says, the fourth straight year, for the fourth straight year, the Thanksgiving resolution from President Barack Obama fails to actually thank God, which is the fundamental reason why Thanksgiving is observed. And they go on to say in 1789, George Washington issued a proclamation that said the main reason is uh, uh, to, for the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that is, that was, or ever will be, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, and that we may uh, unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks. Now, the article goes on to criticize President Obama, saying, For President Obama, Thanksgiving is about food and football, according to his official remarks. Now, here's what's really funny. At the end of it, he actually does mention God. But LifeNews.com and other conservatives are angry because it was only mentioned in passing. It says, Because there for the grace of God go I. That's, that's a quote from the statement. So, first of all, President Obama does mention God in the statement that conservatives are angry with him for not mentioning God. And then, it's actually good that he's respecting the Constitution. It doesn't really matter what President George Washington said about the holiday because one president said one thing and another president saying another thing. The important thing is that the Constitution and our founding fathers would be happy to see that there is actual separation of church and state if there were, right, because President Obama actually right. did mention God. Conservatives just completely apoplectic. They don't know what to do now that President Obama has been reelected. Uh, marriage equality is, is furthering. They're, they're completely out of their minds. I guess they're just going to lie and assume that people won't fact check them. Maybe that's what it is. That's what they did here. We're really angry that President Obama didn't mention God. Part of our complaint is he did mention God just at the end in passing. But he didn't mention God and we're really angry about that. 
But here's the line about when he mentioned God. You know, very consistent message. You know, I would have thought that, you know, conservatives would have been happy that Obama failed to mention Allah, which is the God that they think that he subscribes to. That's the other thing. You would think that President Obama, since he is, of course, Muslim, which is, of course, a bad thing, according to a lot of people, why didn't he mention, why didn't he make a reference to the Quran or to Allah? It's very confusing. Mixed signals from the Muslim president. What, what do we, what do we do, David? I'm confused. Hey, here's one of my favorite clips. Remember a few months ago when this prankster got on Fox News pretending to be a former Obama supporter and basically pranked Gretchen Carlson saying, oh, I don't like the direction Obama's taking the country and I'm voting for Mitt Romney because of a basketball bet or something like that. And it was clearly a joke. The kid wasn't even old enough to vote last election and Fox News didn't do any fact checking. This is a different version of that, and this is like a more serious one that's really, really good. Uh, John Scott was interviewing uh, author Tom Ricks, and Tom Ricks was brought on Fox News on Happening Now to talk about how a lot of Republican lawmakers are now backing off of their conspiracy theory claims regarding the Benghazi attacks. We talked on our last show how John McCain, Senator John McCain, had all these conspiracy theories about Benghazi, and now he's backed off of them, of course, because they were completely warrantless and made absolutely no sense. There was no conspiracy, so on and so forth. This is really good. I'm going to play this video for you. Within a minute, within seconds, uh, Tom Ricks basically says, Fox News is the reason that the Benghazi thing even blew up. And by the way, Fox News is operating as the propaganda, as, a, as an arm of the Republican Party. Interview over instantly. That's a really good way to get yourself kicked off Fox, Fox News. I love this video. Take a look at this. Now, pressure mounting on the Obama administration over its response to the deadly attack on our consulate in, in Benghazi. As Catherine Herridge reported just minutes ago, several top GOP lawmakers are backing off their criticism of U.N. Ambassador Susan Rice. Yeah. Instead, focusing on the White House. Right. Two senators even expressing concerns about a possible White House cover-up. Let's talk about it with Tom Ricks. He is author of The Generals. He has spent dec decades covering our military. He joins Here us now. Here we go. Uh, Senator John McCain has said in the past that he would block any attempt uh, to nominate Susan Rice to become UN, uh, I'm sorry, Secretary of State. She's currently the UN ambassador. He seems to be backing away from that. What do you make of it? Right. I think that Benghazi generally was hyped by this network especially, <laughs> and that now that the campaign is over, I think he's backing off a little bit. They're not going to stop Susan Rice from being Secretary of State. When you, when you have four people dead, including the first UN ambassador, U.S. ambassador in more than 30 years, how do you call that hype? All right, now here we go. This is where he completely breaks it down, and then later we'll go into where he gets himself kicked off. Take a look. How many security contractors died in Iraq, do you know? I don't. No, nobody does because nobody cared. We know that several hundred died, but there was never an official count done of security contractors dead in Iraq. So when I see this focus um, on what was essentially a small firefight, I think number one, I've covered a lot of firefights, it's impossible to figure out what happens in them sometimes. And second, I think that the emphasis on Benghazi has been extremely political, partly because Fox was operating as a wing of the Republican Party. All right. Tom Ricks, thanks very much for joining us today. <laughs> there you go. He's off. So this interview from the time, if you take, if you consider the fact that there was this long introduction from John Scott, th the actual interview lasted 49 seconds, a 49 second appearance. Now, of course, Fox News will probably argue, well, well we didn't kick him off. It was just he was brought on and the interview took its course and it, it ran its course. And that was it. Really? You book people for 49 second interviews now? Obviously, he went out there. He said what we're all very aware of about Fox News and he got himself booted off. Worth it. Completely worth it. Never to be on Fox again. It's great. Uh, and no challenge from Fox News. No, they did not challenge his claim at all. No. Well, I mean, I'm sure that they they. The fact that they didn't challenge it doesn't mean they agree. I'm sure it's policy right. just not to engage it's the in protocol. that. Yeah. Natan, what's your thought on this? I love this. Yeah, this is uh, extremely satisfying when someone calls out Fox on the air and uh, their response is essentially to censor it. No question about it. It's, it's brilliant. Th this and the prank call, Fox News has gotten some tough ones over the last couple of months. It's Monday. Let me recommend a book to you, Lewis, if I may. Please. Our uh, Monday book recommendations made possible in part by A Fashion of Bastards by Joanna Louise Johnson, which according to the culture buzz is absolutely irresistible. Even as it begs the all too serious question, when does high level self-serving manipulation reach the tipping point of permanent harm to our planet? Here's my recommendation for today, Lewis. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. 
The Adventures of Augie March by Saul Bellow. This is from 1953. It is about Augie March, who grows up during the Great Depression. This was actually hard, hard to, to really believe this for some. Some will find this shocking, Lewis. But the first book by Bellow that I've read, and it's, it's fantastic. I mean, the, the writing skill is excellent. The character development is fantastic. This is, I, I hate to I'll call it a coming of age story, but it is a story that tracks Augie March through a period of his life. And the, the flavor and context you get for the Great Depression, the characters in it, including the, the so-called grandmother of Augie March, it's a really good book. You've got to set aside some time for it, though. The edition I have is like 550 pages, and these are some pretty dense pages, I must say. So this isn't one that you're going to read over a weekend unless you're going to spend 12 hours a day reading it, but highly recommend it. I encourage people to check it out. Thank you, David. That was a brilliant recommendation. All right. Today on The Bonus Show, we'll talk about 220 square foot apartments in San Francisco. Would you live in something like this? We'll also talk about churches offering concealed weapons training and blood bricks. Would you be okay having a house made from blood bricks? DavidPackman.com slash membership. It is Cyber Monday. Go to davidpackman.com slash Cyber Monday. Get yourself a membership and a sweatshirt like the one Lewis is wearing at a huge discount. davidpackman.com slash Cyber Monday. We'll take a break. Plenty more after this. The David Pakman Show at davidpackman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Remember, as the holiday buying season heats up, if you do any shopping on Amazon.com, first go to our website, davidpakman.com, click the black banner on the right side of the website, bookmark that link, and use it whenever you shop. It'll send 7% of your purchase to The David Pakman Show instead of to Amazon.com. You don't have to do anything. You just click it, and then you shop. It's great. It's as excellent, David. Excellent. Must be done. You can also become a David Pakman Show member, made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Lewis, this is big news. Liberalbias.com is actually celebrating its first birthday on December 1st. For a whole year now, they've been dedicated to exposing how facts, numbers, reality have a liberal bias. If you're a fan of liberal bias, head on over there. Wish them a happy birthday. Indeed. Please do. Today's new member of the day, David Littman. David Littman. We actually, we need to update our count of what the most common first name is for David Pakman Show members. For a while, I think it was Michael. But there have been a lot of new members named David in the last couple of months, Lewis. And I think we may have, we, we may have a shifting tide in this, uh, in this respect. It's like a, like a David, there should be like a David club. Right. It should be extra membership features only for Davids. What Interesting. Do you think? Interesting. That's an idea. People might then fake it. Yeah. People might pretend to be a David. I'll make a phone call, Lewis. I'll look into that. Okay. Here's a shocking story. On Fox News, Andrea T uh, Tantaros suggested that food stamps could be kind of a diet plan, saying, do you know how fabulous I'd look if I was on the food stamp diet? This was in response to Cory Booker, uh, uh, Newark Mayor Cory Booker, saying that he would do a food stamp diet for, I think it's for a month, actually. Here's the discussion. Here's the video clip. Take a look at this. Socially. 20 seconds left. Could you live on 133 bucks a month for food? No. Andrea. I should try it because you know how fabulous I'd look. I'd be so skinny. I mean, the camera adds, adds 10 pounds. It I, really does. I'm I would surprised. be looking great. 133 bucks a month. Doesn't sound My like wife probably that's... could. My wife, 5'11, weighs 120 pounds. So she could probably. Oh, case closed. So, Game set she, match, no, Mr. More, Booker. Eat, she eats more than I do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, I think Stuart Varney also called that New Jersey uh, or that real estate guy, Mr. Booker, although maybe it was a reference to Cory Booker. That was weird. Regardless, this is very, very insulting. I mean, people are, uh, uh, pe people who are on food stamps, the problem is, do they have enough to eat? And Andrea Tantaros is joking, saying that she would be just so thin and it would be just be so great for her physical appearance if she did the food stamp diet. What's implicit in this, though, is that she's admitting Food stamps don't provide enough sustenance for someone to maintain their weight. I don't know. I don't think that's the point she's trying to make. Right. But she is basically admitting that here. Knowing the, the channel, I mean, the point they're probably all trying to make is that uh, 
no one should have food stamps or something along the lines of that. Well, they've had a long history of dismissing hunger related issues. Back in May, we talked about when celebrity chef Mario Batali was going to do the food stamp challenge and Fox News' Greg Gutfeld asked, does this make you want to slap him around? And around that same time, Sean Hannity was uh, saying that people who have food insecurity should shun the SNAP program and instead just eat more rice and beans, which he said could be purchased for, quote, relatively negligible amounts of money. Those people who don't have enough food are so stupid. Sean Hannity knows, you know, he makes like five million a year. He knows that just buy rice and beans. It's really cheap. Yeah. Nobody, come on, nobody goes hungry, Lewis. Just buy mm -hmm. rice and beans. People don't know the items to buy. Very simple. And Natan, what do you think about this dismissive attitude that we're seeing led by Fox News, but really by a lot of the right about food stamps and just this dismissive nature about hunger as an issue? For me, it's reminiscent of the, the argument that conservatives and Republicans make whenever there's a social program, which is they take a half-assed implementation of it and criticize that it's not as effective as it claimed to be, so we should just oppose it altogether. Like, even with the stimulus, people, you know, Paul Krugman, we talked about this, sort of predicted that if the stimulus was too small, you would have people say, oh, it wasn't really that effective, which right. proves that this, this idea of stimulus doesn't make any sense and we shouldn't yeah. support it. So it seems like a part of that whole thing. Well, let's not have food stamps because the ones that we have don't provide enough support. It also jives with the whole idea, Lewis, on Fox News of uh, uh, poor people have everything they need in this country. They've got cell phones from Obama, even though Bush started that program. They've got Color big TVs. screen TVs, all that stuff. Right. It seems counter counterproductive to their uh, to their narrative here to even state how much money basically the food stamps are equivalent to. Yeah, people would realize how little it is. I know. But yeah. Who knows what they're trying to do? Pat Robertson is now saying he missed God's message about the 2012 election. A few months ago, we talked about Pat Robertson saying that God spoke to him and told him what would happen in the 2012 election. Here's that clip, if you don't remember it. I'm going to read just what I wrote down, and I'm as if I'm hearing from the Lord these words. Your country will be torn apart by internal stress. Mm. A house divided cannot stand. Your president holds a radical view of the direction of your country, which okay, is... Okay, so anyway, uh, apparently last time God spoke to Pat Robertson about the election, he quoted Lincoln, a house divided cannot stand. God apparently very up to speed on relatively modern uh, American history, he knows everything, knows all the quotes, he's quoting Lincoln, and he's saying Obama's bad. Well, now Pat Robertson, the latest is he's admitting he didn't really get the message from God. He, he seems to have missed the message. <laughs> Take a look at this to practice the presence of God, practice the voice of God, practice hearing from God, and then check to see if indeed you are hearing from Him. And uh, so many of us miss God. I tell you, uh, I, I won't get into great detail about elections, but I sure did miss it, and I thought I'd heard from God. I thought I had heard clearly from God. Yeah. What happened? What intervenes? Why? No. Well, well, you ask God, you know. how did I miss it? Well. We all do, and I've had a lot of practice. There you go. So Pat Robertson admitting he missed. You know, I think he's actually wrong here, Lewis. God has spoken, Pat, and he wanted President Obama to win, right? If, if God is omnipotent, he knows he can quote Lincoln, as we saw. He knows everything. If President Obama won, clearly, God wanted President Obama to win. So you should embrace him because he is God's choice. I mean, isn't this the yes. logic? Is if it right? you subscribe to Pat Robertson's... Uh ideology, yeah. then yes, God wanted Barack Obama to win. But in reality, Pat Robertson is a snake oil salesman, <laughs> and uh, he's been BSing everybody. Newsflash, uh, don't listen to Pat Robertson. You know, I have a kind of a shocking revelation to make on the show. I think this will be, I'm, I'm not even sure if I should really admit this. I think people will find it a little bit disturbing, but I kind of wish I was a Republican sometimes. I really do. I mean, uh, life would be so simple. Listen, forget about looking at studies about how does birth control tie into the abortion rate and should women have access and Roe v. Wade. Abortion is murder and I'm against abortion. It would make things really, really easy. Forget about the fight for having textbooks that reflect the scientific consensus and aren't guided by religious dogma, blah, 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 blah. I could just say, listen, um, God created this, uh, this, this universe in seven days and we're, that's what we're going to teach. And anything else is the work of the devil. Taxes, right? 
taxes are bad. We're not going to raise taxes. I'm a Republican. Taxes need to be low. We will not raise taxes. I don't need to think about the effects on people. I don't need to think about all that stuff. I feel like life would be so much easier. I would be so much less conflicted and concerned and stressed about things if I was a Republican. I wish I could be a Republican. Basically, what you're saying is you wouldn't have to think about anything. Is that what I'm saying? I think what you're saying is ignorance is bliss. Natan, what's your reaction to this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the way that Republicans, for the, the mainstream Republicans, think about even government as a general thing is simplistic. They think big government bad, small government good, and they think that the opponents think it's the opposite. Big government good, small government bad, when the reality is their party believes that in principle, and the Democrats actually just believe that the government is a means to an end. And I think that's the basic difference between them. That's the way they think about all issues. Would you consider this taking this? Like, could you convince yourself, Lewis? Could you like psych yourself into just saying, you know what? I'm going for the simple arguments that just sound right uh, at face value without any introspection because it's just going to be easier. And I'm going to just disconnect myself from this nonsense. Could you ever do it? I can't do that. Yeah, I don't think I could either. My mind does not work that way. Yeah, I agree with you. All right, let's take a break. Please join us on Facebook. We passed over Thanksgiving weekend 10,000 Facebook likes. That's a big deal, Lewis. It's good. Yeah, it's, it's steadily uh, rising. Let's keep it going. Let's go for 25,000. Facebook.com slash David Pakman Show. We'll take a break. The Cyber Monday deal ends in hours. David Pakman.com slash Cyber Monday. Stay tuned. Wendell Potter is next. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Joining me is Wendell Potter. He is former vice president of corporate communications at Cigna. He's the author of the book Deadly Spin and also a columnist at the Center for Public Integrity and Huffington Post. Wendell, pleasure as always to talk to you. I think a really good place to start is in light of President Obama's reelection, we have seen certainly some candid admissions, at least, from the right, that it is not likely now that uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, is going to be repealed. Would you consider this kind of a locking in of the Affordable Care Act via the, the President Obama's reelection, or are there still hopes to repeal? I think it is locked in. I think that uh, uh, we'll see. This is a very important year for the Affordable Care Act. A lot has to be done. Just recently, the Department of Health and Human Services released some uh, long-awaited regulations that will be implemented this year. The uh, states have to get ready for the uh, exchanges that they have to set up. Uh, some are doing that and some are not. Uh, if they're not, the federal government will have to do it for them. So it's moving forward. I think what we have to worry about is not that it will be repealed. I don't think there would be, so, there'd be votes in, uh, in the Senate uh, to sustain a uh, uh, to, to pass a bill to repeal it or really gut it, but what we have to do is to make sure that it's not weakened to the point that uh, it's not doing what Congress intended, which is to expand coverage to as many people as possible and to begin to control cost. So is it possible this idea that uh, it may just not be funded? In other words, the law as a law is not repealed but that it, the, the Congress could act in a way to just simply not provide the funding necessary to implement some aspects of the program? You know, I think that it's conceivable, but I don't think they'll be able to do a lot of that. Uh, much of the funding is already in the law. Uh, much of it's already been, uh, uh, much of it has been, been implemented or uh, authorized and appropriated, uh, and much of it has been used. It's out in the communities in many ways. But um, uh, th what we'll have to watch is during the debate, during this lame duck session on the uh, so-called fiscal cliff, cliff uh, some Republicans will obviously want to uh, challenge the administration and Democrats by saying you've got to, uh, if we're going to be doing anything pertaining to entitlements, we've got to uh, look at the Affordable Care Act. I don't think that uh, the administration will want to go there. I trust the congressional Democrats will, will not allow it. That's something we have to be uh, mindful of. 
There's also a separate kind of locking in that may take place in the court of public opinion, because my view for a while has been that Republicans had this small window of opportunity while the public opinion was still mixed about the content of Obamacare. Because my sense is, once these policies and programs start going into effect starting January 1st in particular, a lot of them, the court of public opinion is going to realize, wait a second, we, we don't want uh, Republicans or Democrats to take this away. So I think that in that sense, there was this window window of opportunity, which is rapidly closing. I think that's exactly right. And we are, I think we're already beginning to see uh, uh, some change in public attitudes toward the Affordable Care Act. We've already seen previous polls showing that many of the provisions of the act are very popular, uh, like the ones that begin to close the donut hole in the Medicare prescription drug benefit and that, that allow uh, parents to uh, have their children on their, um, on their policies until age 26 if they can't find jobs that offer benefits. So. Uh, there are a lot, and also, I guess most importantly, the provision that uh, requires insurance companies to uh, uh, take all comers, in other words, not to be able to discriminate as they have in, in years past against people with pre-existing conditions. So I think the window has passed for a lot of the, the changes that the opponents of the legislation, uh, uh, what they wanted to do to it. So I think that we'll see it go forward. Let's go to what you alluded to before, which is some of the choices that states have now. Uh, and I use the term choices a little bit loosely, I guess. We're now starting to hear that certain uh, governors, Republican governors, are going to choose not to put in place, or at least they're now saying they will not be putting in place these uh, uh, state exchanges, which of course will trigger the government, the, the federal government, be uh, putting that in place. We're also hearing re uh, some resistance to the expansions that are put in place by the Affordable Care Act. Talk a little bit about how could that play out? Uh, what's going on and how might that actually play out logistically? Well, the Affordable Care Act uh, specifies that if a state is not willing or ready to implement uh, its exchange uh, on January the 1st, 2014, and actually show evidence uh, during the coming year, 2013, uh, that it will be able to operate its own exchange. And the government, the federal government, will set one up and operate it uh, for, those, for that state. Uh, what we have been seeing is, is a mixed bag. We've seen a lot of states, uh, uh, mainly those that are headed by uh, Democrats, saying they will go forward. They've made a lot of progress in getting things ready to have their exchanges uh, operational. Uh, you've got some states that have Republican governors that have been waiting, have been taking a wait and see uh, uh, stance. They they were waiting to see if the Supreme Court would uphold it and what would happen uh, on the most recent elections. And now that uh, uh, we see that it's going to go forward, a lot of those states are now uh, putting things in place to at least, uh, if not operate their own exchanges, then be <clears throat> able to do it in partnership with the federal government. And then there are some of those uh, that just simply are say, saying that they're not going to be doing it at all. And in those cases, the federal government uh, will step in and set up and operate those exchanges. So they will be in place. Is there not a risk that this idea of trying to kind of drag down the Affordable Care Act by not setting up the exchange could actually backfire in the sense that if the government does step in, sets up an exchange, and it works more or less well, that it actually becomes even more evidence that this was a good idea and actually hurts the, the, the anti-Obamacare cause, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's correct. I think that we will see that the exchanges uh, will be successful. Uh, some states will do them better than others, and it's, you know, it remains to be seen how the federal government will operate um, uh, exchanges in, in numerous states, which is probably the case, but I think it will be successful. Um, you know, the other thing you mentioned is the Medicaid expansion. And some, some governors are saying that they're not going to be uh, taking the federal money to expand their Medicaid programs. And that's something that is their prerogative as a consequence of the Supreme Court decision. I think uh, the, the vast majority of the states will uh, go along and take that money. And as you, as you know, the federal government will pay 100% of the expansion or the cost of the expansion of the Medicaid program until 2016. And then uh, the states began to take a little bit more responsibility, but never more than 10%. Uh, so the federal government will always pay at least 90% of the uh, expansion for the expansion of the Medicaid program. That'll bring a lot of people into coverage, people who have not been eligible in the past, uh, individuals and families, uh, up to 133% of the, of the federal poverty line. So that'll be a very big, uh, big way of bringing more people into coverage. And the thing is, for those governors that are saying they're not going to do it, they're going to be getting a lot of 
pressure from healthcare providers in their own states, as well as insurance companies, I think, uh, to, to accept that money. They're, I think they're, going, they're saying that now for political purposes, but I think when the time comes, they'll want to accept that money. Uh, health, uh, hospitals in particular are wanting to make sure that uh, uh, the, the Medicaid program is expanded because this will uh, reduce the amount of uncompensated care, the bad debt that they've, uh, they've had to, uh, uh, you, know, can, you know, that's always affected their bottom line for many years now. Absolutely. I think that that is the way it's going to go in the end. We've been speaking with Wendell Potter. He's the former vice president of corporate communications at Cigna, the uh, author of the book Deadly Spin, and also a columnist with Huffington Post and the Center for Public Integrity. Wendell, pleasure as always to speak with you. Thank you, David. All right, we'll take a break. We'll be back with more after this. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Our program is mostly supported by individual memberships. Please go to davidpakman.com slash membership and sign up today. Also, if you sign up before midnight tonight, Monday, Cyber Monday, we've got a great membership and hoodie discount package because it is Cyber Monday. Just go to davidpakman.com slash Cyber Monday. The Mars rover has made a discovery that NASA is saying is one, quote, for the history books but they're not telling us what it is. Apparently, we're going to have to wait until next month to find out about it. They're saying it's something big. They are running additional tests to make sure that the discovery does hold up. John Grotzinger, who's the rover mission's principal investigator, said, quote, this data is going to be one for the history books. It's looking really good. What could this be? We don't know. We know that the data comes from a soil sample that was analyzed by the rover sample analysis. And um, that, that's really all we know at this point. Now, we know that NASA is keeping this mostly under wraps because it could be a false alarm. But you would think if there's still a chance it's a false alarm, don't tell us anything at all. Well, I mean, it must mean that they're pretty, pretty sure it is what they're thinking it is. What do you think it could be? Like, what could be one for the history books? I, I don't know. I mean, you'd think if it was... Uh, if it was some form of microbial life or fossilized microbial life or something like that, they they might be going a bit more crazy. But uh, well, they're saying for the history books. I mean, how much crazier can you get? These this is NASA scientists. They're not going to well. One for the history books is different from this one's going to change everything. Hmm. You know. Yeah, they didn't find ET. We can safely assume. Right. Natan, what do you think about this? What what do you think they found? Uh, if it really is something that's going to shock the American public or the world at large, it's got to be something related to life, um, either something related to life ha having existed or existing on Mars, or maybe something uh, that is found on Earth that they found on Mars, which means that there is some sort of a connection between the two and maybe uh, some sort of uh, travel between the two at some point in history. I don't know. Do you think that they may have found the monolith, like in 2001, A Space Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke? I really doubt it. Really? I think they found that one on the Warner Brothers set. I don't think they, <laughs> I don't think they need to run additional tests if, they found, if that's what they found. Maybe they need to just to be totally sure that that's what it is. Uh, you know what? I hope they did. What if they found, uh, what if they found Newt Gingrich like already setting up the, a Mars colony or something? That would be, that'd be fascinating. He's skipping I, the moon. He's going straight to Mars. If, if Newt Gingrich is on Mars already setting up a colony. It means he has very fast travel capabilities. I will never insult him again. <laughs> a woman has been busted for driving 100 miles an hour. Her explanation for why she was doing it, she's not denying it. She's just saying, I was letting the Lord Spirit guide me. This is, this is unusual. She's a Florida woman. Lewis will not find that to be much of a surprise. Lewis talking about incredible Florida driving experiences many, many times. Officers in Fort Pierce observed 41-year-old Melissa Miller driving a silver Toyota south on US-1 with her arm out the window, blowing her horn for 10 seconds, according to the police report. When she was stopped, she explained she had been driving so fast because the Lord, she was letting the Lord's Spirit guide her. 
and the Lord was telling her to blow the horn very specifically. God is very, very involved. With Pat Robertson, he was able to give Pat Robertson a political message using Abraham Lincoln quotes. He was able to very specifically tell this woman, I mean, it's understandable God would tell people how fast to drive, right. but getting involved in the details of whether or not to blow your horn is really specific. There's some serious mental illness here. You think that's what it is? Yes. Uh, she also said that she, um, well, she's, she said a bunch of different stuff. Didn't God direct you, Lewis, once to egg someone's house? I don't think it was God. <laughs> uh, I think it was a friend of mine. God also happens to go by the name Captain Morgan in this particular case. Uh -huh. <laughs> the captain, huh? There's some, there's some question about whether this was not a mental illness issue, but a, drink, a drunk driving issue. Um, but that's not actually mentioned in the charges. She's just facing reckless driving, speeding, and violating pro probation. You know, we, I've I think seen we, a lot of drunk people, and never once have has any of them said uh, that God influenced them somehow. I actually think that this woman's religious freedom was violated. You think so? What was she supposed to do? Is she supposed to disobey the Lord because of man-imposed artificial speed limits? This what if she was right? I know. What if God really did want her to go 100 miles per hour? Serious observation, though. Personal responsibility and heavy religion don't go together that well, do they? I mean, this is a perfect example because personal responsibility, but l listen, God was telling me, uh, I don't know, it doesn't seem like they jive. If, if God did um, demand this, we're in serious trouble. You think so? Yeah. What should happen to someone like this, Natan? And in other words, should they be tried? Like, okay. Some people might really believe that God tells them to do stuff. For example, Pat Robertson. And some people might just be mentally ill. However, there is a blurry line between the two. Do you handle something like this as this woman is simply very religious, however, she still broke the law? Or do you handle it as this woman needs to be treated as a, as a ward of the state? She's mentally ill. Well, if you look at the picture that I've put up uh, behind you, I think you get the idea <laughs> that... Uh, there are a number of illicit drugs that can cause quote unquote spiritual experiences. Yeah. Um, for example, LSD. So <laughs> I don't want to jump to conclusions, but certainly either this person is totally out of her mind or she went out of her mind because of a drug she took. Okay. So a lot of questions here. Let's go to your voicemails. Our voicemail line is available to you 24 hours a day. The number is 2192 David P. Here's a voicemail about our interview with Brian Fisher last week. Hey, David, it's Matt calling from Scottsdale, New York. I wanted to comment on you guys having Brian Fisher on recently. I'm glad you have these people on, and I don't view you having someone like Brian Fisher on the same way I view, you know, CNN and other people having people like Tony Perkins on, where right. they put them up as a credible spokesperson. Uh, but uh, so uh, there is a difference between you and what I see done on uh some television programs. I like that. I like that voicemail because a lot of times we, we get asked, well, you're just giving a platform, blah, 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 blah. It's like when CNN does it. It's really not. CNN will often have these extreme anti-gay nuts on as equivalent points of view, valid points of view on the one hand, on the other hand. When we have these people on, the context is clearly that I think that they are completely wrong and their, and their opinions are not even really valid in, in, in this society. Right. So I think it is very different. It is indeed. And let's go to another voicemail about whether being gay is a choice, another topic that came up with Brian Fisher. Hey, David. Hey, Natan. Hey, Lewis. This is Jeremy from Japan, and I had a message about being gay and about it being a choice or not. People are always saying, it's not a choice, it's not a choice, and I'm gay. And yeah, it's not a choice, but what if it were a choice? What would be so wrong about choosing to be gay? There's nothing wrong with being gay. And... If I had chosen to be gay, it would be no different from if I had not chosen to be gay. I was this is an interesting point, actually, which is let's assume people are choosing to be gay. Since when do we discriminate against people based on, on lifestyle choices, even if they were, right? I mean, I think this is a good point, Natan, but we don't want to go too far with it only because we don't want to give the idea legitimacy. The, the problem is that, uh, and mind you, I am not comparing the two things I'm about to compare seriously. I'm just entering the mind of, of a lunatic right-wing extremist yeah. uh, when I say this. But yeah. if you take the case of like a child molester, uh, I think we could distinguish between a situation where the science says that it's a lifestyle choice, they're choosing to do it, they know it's wrong, and a person who is just drawn to kids sexually, and it's really a mental illness. Right. I think we would all agree that the solution to that problem would be different 
if we change what the supposed cause is. Right. So that's all I'm saying. Okay, so you actually think that it, it you don't you don't agree with with the the idea that it really is n of no consequence whether it's a choice I or not. I think that the idea that only because um, we say something is a lifestyle choice versus just something that someone can't control, in this case, it might not be relevant. But certainly, I don't want to apply that to everything because you can see problems arise. Lewis, I, I mean, I, I agree with Natan. It's interesting to think about, and I mean, it's kind of like the uh, it's kind of like the um, what's his name? The senator. Um, I forget a Muslim Muslim guy. Keith Ellison saying, "So what if the president was, you know?" Oh, Colin Powell actually is the one who said that. Yeah, what saying, "What if he was a Muslim?" Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very good point. All right, keep the voicemails coming to one nine two David P through midnight tonight. Our Cyber Monday special, DavidPackman dot com slash Cyber Monday. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.